بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So الحمد لله. And after four long days, we've come to the you know, final concluding session of this uh, Dora, which is the Q&A session with all of the speakers. And Alhamdulillah, as just as you know, Ustad Tim said at the end of his uh, lecture as well, is that you know it's very pleasing to see that, mashallah, a lot of you uh, put in a lot of effort. You're serious and taking notes uh, in attendance, in your etiquettes. And so on, and that's something really pleasing to see. So, inshallah, I know it's long, I know it's tired, it, uh, t- tiresome, but we only have a couple of hours left, um, inshallah. So, we just need to strive uh, for these remaining a couple of hours, bismillah. Um, so, without any delay, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Ustad Tim, bismillah. He'll be the one reading out the questions, um, inshallah. Please so, what we're going to try to do, inshallah, ta'ala, is to ask different types of questions to different people well otherwise I would love to ask our Sheikh Sheikh Tafa to answer all the questions I would love to ask the Sheikh all the questions that can if there's something that came from the person's lesson specifically and there's some questions Sheikh Hudayfa chose that he would like to answer for himself uh, so inshallah we'll ask those like in the first question we want to ask to our Sheikh Sheikh Tafar, inshallah ta'ala. This is the question that he says, that he is the only one, the only one, in a Sufi family, a very strong family. So how do you live between these two people? And they are a Sufi family, and they are the only one in the Sunnah. So how do you live with them and live with them? So the question is, how can I deal with being the only Athari in, in a very Sufi family? That tries to lead me astray all the time. Wahum you have iluna and you will learn and you die. Walla he has a rajul Ida Kana Mustarran Likiyam Mahum La Basavin Shalla Ida Kana Yuhavil Wajubalig Waju Ayusle Ayla Wama Ida Kana Mutashadina Misle Ibrahim or other. فلا بد أن الرجل يعتسم ويحفظ دينه وأكيدته ومنهجه يعتذل يعتذل عنهم كما قال الله عز وجل في القرآن في إدة آيات واصبر نفسك مع الذين يدعون ربهم بالغداة والعشي يريدون وجعه ولا تعد عينك عنهم وذلك في سورة في سورة آل إمران جاء وفي سورة النساء والمائدة كلاهما فلا بد أن يعتذل هذا هذا الرجل عنهم ويصبر على مشقته على بكيام على هذه الأكيدة السلفية الصحية. So the sheikh he said that this and I'm going to paraphrase what the sheikh said. Like in the sheikh he said that there's two uh, situations here. In one situation, it can be that the person is willing to be with them and to try to convince them and to convey to them the truth and he can manage that situation for himself and in the other situation the person feels that they are you know, they are very strict with him and staunch with him and they're pushing him and in that situation then the person should behave with them like Ibrahim to behave towards his father as and the Sheikh mentioned and you know, that he has to distance himself you know, uh, from uh, and he has to distance himself from those people. Uh, as the Sheikh mentioned, and he mentioned the ayah, that keep yourself patient, and to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that keep yourself patient among those people who, call, who remember Allah in the morning and the evening, and seeking thereby his face. So this is in the case that these people are putting that severe pressure on him, so he should take from the example of Ibrahim and his father, alayhi salatu wassalam. Uh, the next question we can go for the, one of the questions for Ustad Hudayfa. Okay, but I've got yours ready, so yours can come after that. If you're going to give me the questions to read, then you have to let me. That is, uh, you mentioned proofs regarding the obligation of following the Sunnah. Could you please answer some of the doubts of those who oppose this? 
Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, um, we went through the book regarding hujjiyat to sunnah the authority of the sunnah, and we mentioned all of these different types of proofs showing us the obligation of following and clinging on to the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We mentioned approximately 30 ahadith, uh, sorry, 30 ayat, and about 17 ahadith, and 22 aqwal, and actions of the salaf, and also six statements regarding ijma' consensus. And that, you know, a person who just reads that and ponders over it, it gives them a strong foundation in regards to this issue. And it should not leave any room for any doubt that they have to follow the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why you know, we started uh, with this. Even though after the lecture, I did get a few questions regarding some of the doubts, which we'll address, uh, inshallah, very quickly and summarized. But a student of knowledge, what he learns first is always the foundations. He doesn't learn the doubts first, because those doubts will you know, cling on to his heart, and that could be, you know, even if it starts as something small, it could lead to that which is greater in terms of uh, deviance. So therefore, a student of knowledge needs to always lay that foundation for him. And that's why we started uh, regarding these uh, ayat and all these uh, hadith, aqwal of the salaf, actions of the sahaba, uh, and c- consensus of the, uh, of the ummah. As for some of the doubts, right? then firstly, like I just mentioned, because we have that foundation, then those doubts shouldn't really have an effect on a person. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he says, فَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابُ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought down the Qur'an, and there are those ayat which are clear-cut. The meanings, the principles, the concept are clear-cut. No one has any doubt in, the, in their meanings. هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابُ And that's the majority of the Qur'an. And then there are some which are mutashabihat, some which are ambiguous for um, some people. So, what Ahl al-Bid'ah, people of innovation try to do, is when they start a conversation with you, or they start a study of a topic, or they want to prove their point, they won't start with that which is clear-cut. They'll start with that which is ambiguous. So they'll bring to you some of these doubts, and if you don't have that foundation, then you know those doubts can um, have an effect on you. If you look at, firstly, a hadith in Abu Dawood, Narrated uh, 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 hadith in Abu Dawood, I believe hadith number 4604. The Prophet ﷺ, he prophesies this. He says, That I was given the book and something similar to it, i.e., another revelation, which is the Sunnah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, And there will be a time where a person will replete on his couch, i.e., he's eaten and his belly is full and he's just relaxing on his couch. And he will say, upon you is the Qur'an. Whatever is halal in the Qur'an, make it halal. Whatever is haram, make it haram. So this is a prophecy of the Prophet sallallahu that there will be people who come later on who reject a hadith and they'll stay just stick to the Qur'an. As for these doubts, then uh, there's two types of doubts depending on those people who reject hadith. Because rejecting hadith is of two types. Either partially rejecting hadith or completely rejecting hadith. Those who partially reject a, a, a hadith are the people of innovation, those that reject khabar ahad in issues of aqidah. And they'll bring the issue of aqidah being something which is certain, because even the word aqidah linguistically is a knot which is you know tied, there's no room for any movement, it's something which has to be certain. And if a, a narration or a hadith is narrated by a singular person, he can make a mistake, so we're not 100% certain if he's correct. So therefore, because that certainty is not there, we can't accept that hadith. This is the argument that they bring. And uh, so how can we answer this doubt? Just in very, you know, s- summarized points. Firstly, this goes against the understanding of all of the Salaf. The ijma' of the Salaf, it goes against it. Because the first person to mention this issue in the books of hadith was Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, rahimahullah, who passed away in the year 463. So he's 5th century. And the ulama mentioned that he took this from the books of Usul, and Usul al-Fiqh. And Usul al-Fiqh, a majority of those who wrote in it, especially at that time, were from Ahlul Kalam, Asha'ira, and so on. 
As for if you look at the statements of the muhaddithun, you will not find the splitting of hadith into mutawatir <coughs> and uh, and ahad. And even if that splitting was there, it doesn't have any uh, uh, any effect on the authenticity of the hadith. Because the muhaddithun have what? They have the five conditions for a hadith to be authentic. None of those conditions mention mutawatir or ahad. Right? So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلْيُنْذِرُ قَوْمُهُمْ إِذَا رَجِعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّمْ يَحْذُرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he mentions when the Muslims go out to fight then a group of people need to remain behind to learn their religion so that when those Muslims who have gone out come back they can teach them this is an ayah in the Quran right so it's not a hadith where they could argue about its authenticity it's clear cut ayah and what's the ayah saying? That a group of people have to remain behind. Not mutawatir, not to that, that level. That is a massive group, 100 people, 50 people, whatever it may be. Just some sort of group so that they can teach the people when they come back. So even the Quran. So if, it, if the condition was we can only accept aqidah and uh, Islam from a large number of mutawatir narrations, then that would not make sense. Likewise, the prophets and messengers themselves, they were singular people who were sent. <coughs> Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ himself, when he sent... Um, the Sahaba to teach them not just Aqidah but the whole religion when he sent Sahaba to other places he sent them as individuals he sent Mu'adh radiallahu anh to one side of Yemen he sent Abu Musa al-Shari radiallahu anh to the other side of Yemen and so on so you can see that actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sending the companions they were singular like as when he sent Musa ibn Umair uh, to teach the people of Medina before doing Hijrah again Ahad and lastly, even if we were to say that it doesn't give us uh, full 100% certainty, that's, you know, you can still act upon Adhan uh, al-Rajih. You can still act upon that if the Qara'in are there. So even from that uh, mantiqi aspect, uh, it's not uh, fully correct. So that's in regards to those who uh, reject Khabar Ahad. Uh, in terms of those who reject uh, Ahadith completely, they are known as you know, Al-Qur'aniyun. Uh, they bring uh, many doubts. Firstly, they will bring uh, many ahadith that will mention um, you know, sticking to only the Quran. Majority of all those ahadith are either da'if jiddan, very weak, or fabricated. As, and that ruling has been given not by one scholar, but by many of the ulama regarding those ahadith. Secondly, they'll bring many um, ayat that will mention everything is in al-kitab, in the book. So therefore, if everything is in the Quran, then we don't need uh, we don't need to go to the Sunnah. And the answer to this is from, is from two aspects. Firstly, uh, some of those ayat, when the word Al-Kitab is mentioned, it's not referring to the Quran. But rather it's referring to Al-Lawh Al-Mahfuz. That everything is in Lawh Al-Mahfuz. And the siyaq of the ayah, the, the context of the ayah, and what comes before and after, uh, indicates toward that. So for example, وَمَا مِدَّابَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا وَيَعَلَى مُسْتَقَرَّهَا وَمُسْتَوْدَعَهَا كُلٌّ فِي كِتَابٍ That there's no animal on the earth Except Allah told us everything about it. All of that is in the kitab, in the book. Now the Quran doesn't tell us about every single animal. Right? So all those details are mentioned in Lawh al And even, let's say, there are some ayat that do talk about the Quran. Then we say, okay, the Quran itself in 30 different places tells us to follow the Prophet Sallallahu So, okay, let's follow the Quran by following the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu as commanded in 33. Uh, about 30 odd different places and another doubt that they bring is the famous ayah inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafizun that verily we have brought down the dhikr and we are the ones who have preserved it i.e. we brought down the Quran and we are the ones who have preserved it so therefore the Quran is preserved and that same preservation is not for the sunnah so therefore we cannot follow uh, the sunnah because it is not preserved that's their argument so how do we answer this? We say firstly, who said that the word dhikr is in this ayah is restricted to only the Qur'an? Many, if you look at the books of Tafsir, have explained it to mean the religion generally. Or even if you don't take it to the extent of the whole religion, it's referring to the revelation. And the sunnah itself is also a revelation. <coughs> the Prophet does not speak from his own desires, rather it is revelation which has been revealed. So the sunnah is also a revelation. Also, the same people who transmitted the Qur'an were the same ones who transmitted the Sunnah. If you look at the ijazat in a hadith, 
and you look at the ijazat in the Quran, they go through the same people. Now ijaz in the Quran goes all the way back to the same tabi'een, the same sahaba, Uthman radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and so on, and then to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then to Jibreel, and then to Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. And then also, no, with the Quran, we can say, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said he is the one that's going to preserve it. But then, alhamdulillah, we have the muhaddithun, the scholars of hadith, the ahlul hadith, they are the ones who have preserved the sunnah for us. And a person, only when he studies the science of hadith properly, then he realizes how much the muhaddithu, how much diqqa, how much uh, precision they went to into preserving hadith. That even if a letter was different, they would realize. If one letter, one harakah was something different, they would realize that this is something wrong and they would pick up on that. They would study the whole lives of every single narrator and they'll pick up the smallest of uh, details. So these are just uh, some general points regarding those who reject hadith. Um, uh, these two groups are from those who attribute themselves to Islam. Then obviously you do get uh, the Orientalists, they've got their own doubts uh, and so on. Um, so it's also important to uh, study some of them. You know, For example, they'll say, as Mahabd al-Hadi uh, mentioned yesterday, they'll say that the Prophet ﷺ passed away, and then 200 years later Imam al-Bukhari came along, where did he get all these hadith from? And we talked about it, how in the time of the Prophet there were Sahaba who wrote hadith, like Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, Ali radiallahu an, uh, and others. There were uh, tabi'een who wrote a hadith. Then Imam al-Zuhri rahimahullah co compiled the uh, hadith. And then in the second century, so many ulama uh, wrote hadith, like Imam Malik, then Imam Ahmad, and then Imam Bukhari came along. So if a person, and this shows the importance of studying the foundations, if a person knew the history of hadith, you can answer majority of these doubts, you know, without even studying the doubt itself. So, you know, a lot of people were asking this question, so I thought I'll just give a summarized answer regarding it. Um, Wallahu a'lam. Okay, so this question, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to ask it to Ustad Abu Musab, bi'nilai ta'ala. Uh, what is your advice when it comes to explaining to non-Muslims in regard to things we don't, ag we don't agree with, uh, they don't agree with in our religion? It's easier to explain to Muslims why they're wrong, because even if they're sinful and ignorant, you can provide evidences yani from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. But with a non-Muslim, you don't have that same level of comfort, comfort and understanding, especially in matters they find hard to grasp. Jazakallahu khairan. Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad. On the contrary, I would say it could be even easier to explain to the non-Muslims why we do or don't do certain things than the Muslims. Because... Sometimes the Muslims already know, but they have an opposition to your opinion. And you try to deliver the message many times and not get the results that you hope. But we learn from Yusuf alayhi salam, this is a fundamental principle. <coughs> the idea of answering, consider this to be a misconception. Your job is to deliver Tawheed. Everything else is a bonus and secondary. You being able to address misconceptions about Islam is an extra feature that you add. It is not your main role and objective. When Yusuf السلام, was in prison and the two uh, prisoners joined him, he told them, no food will come to you except that I would have interpreted the dream for you before your food comes. And then he immediately jumped to Tawheed. Inni taraktu millata qawmin la yu'minuna billah. I have left the nation of people who don't believe in Allah and they are regarded the, the hereafter disbelievers. Ibrahim. Then I followed the, the footsteps of my forefathers Ibrahim and he mentioned them. Ya sahibai sijin, a'arbabun mutafarriquna khayrun amillahu al-wahidu al-qahar. Or have, do have, having many gods, all companions of the prison, is having many gods better or the one, the one who's irresistible. You don't worship besides them except names that you named, you and your forefathers. Allah did not send down any sultan. After he gave him a whole lecture on Tawheed, he said, as for one of you 
and he went on to interpret the dream. So the scholars take from this, and based on the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً And all of you should know, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ so your, your actually your job is to deliver to them So we have two scenarios Scenario number one They ask you why don't you Muslim Why don't you listen to music What's wrong with music Either you're capable Of explaining why And that depends on your knowledge Your skills Your a, a set of things But I'm going to assume that you don't What you can do Is give them da'wah to Tawheed Because they ask you a question about Islam so you use this opportunity to deliver the message of Tawheed. No matter how minimal and how uh, uh, concise and short the message may be, at least it will open the door. At least it will open the door. But you would assume after some time, especially if you're a student of knowledge, <coughs> or you seek it to be on, excuse me, then you will be able to explain yourself and you can connect it to Tawheed. Meaning, you can tell them, look, there are certain things that I understand. It's, it's, this is called uh, uh, empathy. I don't know if you guys know the difference between sympathy and empathy. Empathy is when you put yourself in someone else's shoes and you act accordingly. So, for example, if somebody was begging in front of the masjid and you went out and you, and you felt bad for this person, but you, you, know, you just made dua for him. He said, May Allah grant you sustenance and you left. This is sympathy. You, you feel bad. Empathy is that you actually pause for a minute and you, you put yourself in his shoes. If you were in this predicament, do you want people to stop by and make dua for you or do you want people to give you money? So you stop and you give him money based on the fact that you put yourself in his predicament and realize that you needed more. So put yourself in that person's shoes and you'll be able to better explain those, uh, those intricate matters. The bottom line is that you want to tell them that some things you may not understand and we understand Islam is a religion of do's and don'ts there are many restrictions but they're ultimately for your for the growth of your spirit spirituality therefore you're good even that scratch on the surface will will make them think and reflect the more evidence you know the more you can explain the more you've read this works of the scholars the more you can explain and that's I cannot you know spend take everybody's time trying to explain all that to you right now but I hope you get the point. The bottom line is, don't shy away and don't make it seem like it's an impossible mountain to climb. If you fail in everything, at least give them da'wah to Tawheed or tell them, you know what, that's an excellent question. How about we go have a cup of coffee tomorrow? I'm going to ask some people and come back to you. And the next day you bring a little booklet about La ilaha illallah and you put it on the table and then you try to explain as much as possible. You've done, you've done your job. You've done your job, inshallah. Allahu alam. So the next, uh, what I'm going to do is I have quite a few on my talk and I'm just going to go very, very quickly. But the big one that people asked about is accepting gifts that are given on the days of the festivals and whether Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an accepted uh, a gift at the time of the Persian New Year. So here... Sahih, the, the scholars, they have a discussion about it. And it's true that many of them, even Shaykh al-Islam, rahimullah ta'ala, what's apparent from what he said, is that he said, فَهَذَا كُلُّهُ يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ لَا تَأْثِيرَ لِلْعِيدِ فِي الْمَنْعِ مِنْ قَبُولِ هَدِيَتِهِمْ يعني, there is, there is not that, is an evidence that there's no harm in accepting a gift from them. But there are some conditions. He said, بَلْ حُكْمُهَا فِي الْعِيدِ وَغَيْرِهِ سَوَىٰ But there are some conditions. From the shurut is, in that they put for it, is that it should not be food that was sacrificed for that day. It should not be meat that was sacrificed for that celebration. It should not be an item that assists in celebrating it, like the candle. And it should not be something that is accepted out of a love for them and their festival, but something that any somebody came and gave you like, they said, oh, we just want to give you a gift. We, we just want to give you a gift. So you, you, it brings their heart to Islam. Yani. So some of them mentioned this, yani, this uh, issue. Like, and to be honest with you, uh, it's a discussion. 
any it is there's a there's a discussion about it and the important thing is that a person doesn't feel an affinity with them and they don't get close to them they don't and as for like, somebody comes and gives you a gift and the fact that it's on one of the days of their celebration that in itself is not helping them to celebrate but the problem is when it brings an affinity to a person's heart like the person starts to you know, love their celebration or love them because of it otherwise as a dawah issue somebody comes and gives you a gift you can accept that gift so here there are some issues here like are you allowed to accept a christmas bonus when paid at work so here that's the that's the issue the, the gift is given here it's got nothing to do with christmas in reality it's to do with simply just a gift that is given to workers at the end of the year if we're based on that we hope that it's not a problem are you allowed to wear and buy clothes with trees and stars and things people would say were linked to the festival of christmas outside of christmas for here there are two separate things there's something that's directly related to christmas this no you can't like for example something that is directly related to christmas you can't wear it even outside of christmas time but here now we're talking about something that isn't like winter wintery things snowy scenes that's not related to to christmas so there's no any stars and it's not related to christmas specifically for this outside of christmas time also seems to be any also what about items of food that are th in themed packages like the coffee cups that have the christmas decorations around it and this it comes under the ruling of what is sold in the souq min bab tijara that has nothing connected to their eat so it's permissible to buy does that make sense and it's just sold in the souq at that time min bab tijara it's got nothing to do with their eat and nothing to do so that comes under that ruling inshallah ta'ala and we hope those questions yani uh, and it made sense by the light and Allah is what you know best. Type so I'll follow the Sheikh. Sheikh and Ahsan Allah, who Ilaykum, a Sophia, Yakulun, and whom Yaron and Nabiya Sallallahu Alaihi was Selma Filmanam, who and who you are Fikuhum, Allah Amalihim, Kelmolid, Wahiri. ويقولون ويستدلون بقوله من رآني في المنام فقد رآني فكيف نجيب أحسن الله إليك والله أولا يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن جاءكم فاسق بين بين فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوم بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين والمصيبة الكبرى الرسول يأتي ويدخل في المدارس والمجالس وخاصة في في الهند وباكستان كلهم كل يوم الخميس الرسول يحضر من مشايخنا الشيخ أحمد والشيخ محمد زكريا القادوي الميري ويقول ثلاث مرات الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم جاء عندنا في الهند في سهارنبور في بيته لا حول ولا قوة نحن في طبقة الأرض ورسول سلم أقاد راح إلى هنا لا حول ولا قوة ثلاث مرات وينقلون بعض علماء من لاهور الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يطبخ الخبز وعدس والبرياني في مدينة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وكان يقدم إلى شيخ ذكريا لا حول واحد تعرفون عنتم واحد تاهر القادري يلقب بشيخ الإسلام الشيطان ها؟ ها؟ لا حول ولا قوة هو يقول ها؟ هو يقول لما زرت بغداد الشيخ عبد القادر الجيني يعني كان يعني مروحة مروحة يدي كان في يده وكان يفعل هكذا هكذا حتى لا يتعسر الحرارة إلي وكل شيء خرافات أولا نعتقد إن جاءكم فاسق بنبا فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهلا الصوفية هم كذابون لا يقبل كلامهم الشيء الثاني الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم الهدي الصحيح من رآني في المنام فقد رآني لا نكذب ولكن الهدي الذي رواه الإمام الحاكم رحمه الله جاء رجل عند عبد الله ابن عباس قال يا شيخ اليوم ليلا رأيت الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم 
فقال ما شاء الله رأيته كيف كان حليته بين لنا كيف كان رأسه كيف كان شعره وكيف كان وجهه فشل هذا الرجل فشل فقال هذا رجل كذاب الحقيقة لا نذكر الرسول لا يرى في المنام يرى إذا كان ولكن بشرة الرجل الذي يقول رأيت رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم أولا هو يار نسأل الآن هو هو يعرف حلية النبي أو شماء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أم لا هذا شيء مهم شيء مهم ويأمر بشيء حلال أو حرام إذا كان هذه الشروط يعني هو الرجل رجل ديني رجل موحد متبع السنة رجل صادق والأمين ويبين حليته طبقا للأسل يقال هذه رحمة ويقول هذه لك فضيلة ولكن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا قال لي هو أمرني كذا وكذا إذا قال لا يكون حجة ولا يكون هذا الرجل صحابيا الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم عند الصوفية يكون يسكن في شرق يوم ليلة الخميس والرسول في 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 المدينة في قبره يقول هذه الأدعية الصلوات مئة مرة بعد ساعة ثاني أشر ليلا يأتيك الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وهذا الرجل يبين سباحا هذه الخرافات كلها إذا جاء برجل صادق أمين نصدق إذا كان خبره طبقا للشريعة الإسلامية أو موافقا لهلية النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأما إذا كان هذه الصوفية الصوفية عندهم يأتي الشيطان ويأتي الجن ويأتي الأولياء ويأتي كل شيء يأتي لهم حتى رواح الخبيس والدليل تنزل الملائكة والروح تنزل الملائكة والروح هذه أشياء خرافية لا نعتقد عليهم إن شاء الله So the Sheikh, the first thing that he said is uh, he brought the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, "Ya Allahina Amanu In Jaakum Fasiqum Bi Naba In Fatabiyanu." Ah, the question. Okay, so the question was: the Sufiya claim they see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream, and that he approves of their actions, like the Maulid or certain actions, and they quote the evidence of the Hadith: "Whoever sees me in a dream has certainly seen me." So the Sheikh, first of all, said the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, "Ya Allahina Amanu In Jaakum Fasiqum Bi Naba In Fatabiyanu." That if an if a disobedient person comes to you with news, make sure of it. You make sure and verify the news that comes to you. That's the first thing. Uh, and these people, they have, he, the Sheikh said, they have many, many made-up stories. They have stories of the Prophet coming to India and Pakistan, and you know that he visited this three times in this house, and that he bread and lentils, and that he, you know, all kinds of stories that the that the Sheikh mentioned. And he, he mentioned any yeah, from the people that had these stories, and he mentioned, for example, the likes of Tahir Qadri, and what he said, any yeah, about any yeah, some of the stories that he made up about people. So he said the point is that these people are liars, and we don't accept the speech that they say. As for the hadith, whoever seen me in the dream has truly seen me. The Sheikh said this hadith we accept it as a hadith, like it's narrated by Al Hakim. What came from that a man came to Abdullah bin Abbas in radiyallahu anhuma. And that man said that I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a dream last night. So he said to me, describe to me his characteristics. Describe to me, for example, how was his face? How was his hair? How? And when the person was unable to do so, and this is a person who is not telling the truth. And the Sheikh said, we don't deny the truth of this hadith. Whoever seen me in a dream has seen me. But there are three conditions the Sheikh brought. The first one is that the person has seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam according to his shama'il, how his description is in the sunnah. The second one is that he doesn't bring something that is in it, haram. For example, bringing something that is, it has to be in agreement with the sharia, and in agreement with the Quran, not that suddenly everything halal became haram and what, ha what was haram became halal. And the third is that the person who is telling you this dream is a person of tawheed, trustworthy, a person known for being truthful. So he brought these three things, that he's known for being truthful, that 
he hasn't the, the dream hasn't changed halal into haram and that the Prophet has seen the way that he was in his dream. He says, then we say to him, this is a virtue. You, you got a virtue, a, a gift from Allah that this was given to you. He said, but the, what he sees in the dream will not be a hujjah. It's not a proof in Islam. And he, what he sees in that dream does not become sharia. It's not a proof. And he doesn't become a sahabi because of it. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't like on sahabi. He doesn't become a sahabi because of it. And the Sheikh, he mentioned several stories. Well, I wish you wrote them in more detail, but he brought the stories of some of, of what the people do and what some of them said. And he said everything comes to the Sufi, and the Shayateen, the Jinn, the Awliya, the, and they have all kinds of, and subhanAllah, of the, the, the claims of the things that visit them and, and what have you. I think this, that's a summary of what the Sheikh said to the best of what I could write. Okay, next uh, question. Um, Sheikh Hudayfa, this one is for you. We talked about Tawheed. So, what is Shirk? In this way, Marani, Hadis, Marani, Fakadra, Filmana, Fakadraani, Hadis, Fishamal, Tirmidi, Sharhana, Surah, Shaimal, Shamal, Tirmidi, Takriban, we had a Hadis, Sharhana, who, Mal, who, Amale, Havale, Nisvasara, Bil Urdavia. وَشَرْحَ كُلُّهَا مَوْجُودَةٌ فِي يُوتُوبِ إِذَا أَرَادَ عَدٌ أَنْ يَرْجِعْ إِلَيْهِ وَدَاقُدْ بِالْأَمْسِلَةِ وَيَعْنِي خِدَعَاتَ الصُّوْفِيَةِ الشَّيْطَانِيَةِ كُلُّهَا بَيَّنَّا بِالْإِكْتِسَاءِ مَوْجُودُونَ The Shaykh said, this hadith can be found in the Shema'il of Imam Al-Tirmidhi and the Shaykh said, I've got an explanation of it, it's on YouTube in Urdu and he said, we went into details in this explanation of the hadith, whoever sees me in a dream has truly seen me, along with the examples of the false things that, and the invented lies that the Sufiya brought in this regard. So he said, whoever wants to go back to it, they can find my explanation of it on YouTube in the Urdu language. And <laughs> حول بلوغ المرا كتاب السلاح بلوغ المرا وناكشني بعض الصوف بعض الصوفية ذكر من نصف ساعة والله لما رأي نمت رأيت أن الرجل يدور وقال يا شيخ ظفر أنت صدقت فلله الحمد ولكن هذا أول مرة نبين لا يكون هذه الكرامة كرامة انتهت ولكن ما ما بينت لهذا ولا قلت لهذا هذا بكل كذا وكذا ولكن لما ناقشني في هذا الحديث هذا الذي غير صحيح وكذا وكذا نفس الليله رايت الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم اشارني يعني قلت قولا صحيحا وهؤلاء الصوفيه كلهم او غير يعني مخطئين والله ولله الحمد ولكن لا لا ينقلوا أني تنقلوا أني ورنا لما مررتوه برا البيت يجي يكبرون راسي The Sheikh said I also saw the the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in a dream. He said I was teaching بلوغ المرام صح شيخ. And the Sheikh said he was في الشارقة. And he said. مسجد المصلى. So he was teaching in in الشارقة. And the Sheikh he said that and he had and he described. And he what some of these the things what the Sufiya had, and he said that I saw the the Prophet in the dream, and he said to me that you told what you said was the truth, and what those people said they were, and they were wrong in it. But he said that we <laughs> he said that, and he, uh, all praise is due to Allah. So the Sheikh said that, uh, and he, if we tell the people, if we tell the Sufiya about this, they will come and uh, kiss my hand. <laughs> 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 أحسن الله إليكم شيخ الله الله نعم we talked about توحيد سواء شرك نعم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so we talked a lot about توحيد what is شرك a person only truly understands شرك if he understands what توحيد is and likewise a person only truly understands توحيد if he understands what شرك is and that's why the poet he says عرفت الشر لا للشر ولكن التوقيف هم لم يعرف الشر يقع فيه 
the poet he says that I learned the evil not because of the evil itself, not because it's something that I like and I enjoy, but it's something uh, So I learned it so that I can stay away from it. And whoever does not know the evil, then he's going to fall into it. Right? So it's not enough just for a person to learn about isbat, about establishing a tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he needs a second pillar of tawheed, which is an nafi, which is to know about how to negate shirk from, uh, to, to, to negate uh, shirk. And as Al Mutanabi said, that when you know the opposite of something, then the thing itself becomes, becomes clear. So if a person's understood Tawheed, then the meaning of shirk is very easy, it's just the opposite. Tawheed is, in the Islamic context, is to single out Allah in everything which is exclusive to Him. Right? Anything which is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything which is from the specialties of Allah, anything which is from those things which is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, affirming it for only Allah alone, that is Tawheed. And then the ulama add on the rest of the definition. The rest of the definition is just an explanation of what is exclusive to Allah. So from his rububiyah, his actions, the fact that he's a creator, he's a provider, he's a controller of all affairs, he owns everything and so on. And from his uh, worship, that all worship is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Again, that's from the specialties of Allah, i.e. those things which are only for Allah. And likewise, his names and attributes. So these three types of tawheed is just an explanation of that which is exclusive to Allah. So what is Tawheed? Singling out Allah in everything which is exclusive to Him. If you know what Tawheed is, right, shirk is just the opposite. Making anything which is exclusive to Allah for other than Allah. Right? And the ulama have you know, different definitions but they all revolve around this. Anything which is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you give it to somebody else or something else, that's shirk. So for example, the greatest thing would be worship. So anytime you direct any form of worship to other than Allah, then it is shirk. So when you pray salah to other than Allah, it is shirk. When you make dua to other than Allah, it is shirk. And so on. Even when, even if you're, you know, you're not uh, praying to other than Allah in terms of major shirk, praying to a grave and so on, but you're praying salah, and then your intention changes to show off to somebody, that's a form of shirk because now you're not praying to Allah anymore. You're praying because of? Uh, to show off to another person. It's a form of minor shirk, generally, but it's still a form of shirk because it's not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Likewise, anything, like we said, anything which is exclusive to Allah. So if you believe that there's another creator with Allah, you believe that there's somebody else who controls things in the universe. For example, the Sufi believe that there are these, I think they call four abdal, which are always, or they have the ghosts and they have all these different terminologies. That they, there's, in, in, the, in the dunya, there's always four of them and they control everything which, which is going on uh, in the universe. And the things like this, that's shirk. That's shirk, right? Because who's the only one that controls all affairs? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is the one that only creates everything and provides for everything? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a very simple uh, explanation of shirk. And then obviously, uh, after that, we have the different types of shirk. So shirk in terms of its ruling is two types, major shirk and minor shirk. Major shirk takes you out of the fold of Islam, minor shirk does not. Major shirk causes all of your deeds to be nullified. So if you worship Allah for 70 years, but you die upon major shirk without doing tawbah, then those 60, 70 years are wasted. But that's not the case with minor shirk. Minor shirk just nullifies that particular action that you are doing. And if you die upon major shirk, you're in the hellfire forever. And with minor shirk, it's not the case. And the ulama split shirk into other types as well. Some split it into shirk in uluhiyah, shirk in rububiyah, shirk in asma'a wa sifat, and so on. And within Allah, you can study all of these things in, um, in more detail in the books, inshallah. Maybe from the most basic of books that a person should study in regards to shirk is al-qa'id, al-arba', the four principles regarding shirk. Now, Allah Okay, so the next question is from Ahmed i think this what question is directly related to one of your to the, the class inshallah at least I, that's what i think what's the translation of yed in the arabic language is it restricted to hand or can it be translated as arm or forearm because at times in arabic books the whole in the, the whole arm is labeled like that does that make sense yeah it makes sense but i i i, I don't want to answer if i'm not sure so I'll, I'll refrain from, from answering until I get back to my, my notes, inshallah. Can I give you another, another one? Yeah, again? please. Okay, inshallah. Uh, so the next one is, is it against the habit of the Salaf to debate with the Mubtadi'ah, or is it the issue that is, yani, 
organizing a debate that's the issue this is directly directed to you specifically tamam the uh, there's a there's a lecture or a talk or more of a podcast i had with uh, one of the brothers on youtube titled are debates debatable and um, so that is basically a history of how we approach the matter of of debates uh, debates are to be uh, are, are not from the way of ahl sunnah wal jamaa unless under very strict conditions the debater has certain qualifications that allow him to enter into this this realm it's it's a very critical one because you're a representative i think we answered that in the class by the way it, you're representative of islam <coughs> and if you're not going to be able to represent the truth then you're giving a victory to the the, the deviants the deviant person or the the ideology that they're trying to promote so for a person to believe that they have reached that point where they are qualified to not only deliver the truth but also answer all the relevant misconceptions uh, is something that very few people have really the ability to do so some people think too good of themselves that they think that they are fit for the for the task even though they're not the modern day debates the way they are set up today they're they're done in a way where they're also uh, very uh, counterproductive in a sense that there's interruptions there are people speaking over others they're screaming over each other they're rude to each other they're insulting over each other i think in almost every debate i've seen the amount of insults back and forth does not serve the per the, the message of islam uh, uh, ego gets in in the way and a person just wants to defeat his opponent even if islam looks bad at the end and that is not how we go about it and that is not the objective of uh, the debates in the first place and so uh, the details for all that is found in the talk are debates debatable but my advice to you is do not engage in debates do not attend debates do not listen to debates because this is an advanced subject and it requires qualified people and most of the stuff that you find on youtube is done by underqualified people 99% i would say of the debates that are related to islam online the actual person speaking on behalf of islam might have a lot of good arguments but is deviant in zaqida or has problems with his manhaj so while he serves one purpose he will destroy another 3 4 so you still get an issue you still have an issue at the end how many uh, people upon the salaf are out there actually doing debates you you name them You know, the only one I know of is Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan who debated a couple of people. And that's it. And we could say that Sheikh Abdul Rahman can handle business in this regard. Still you will see in these debates yani the, the, you don't feel like you don't feel like the, the the objective was fulfilled just because of the nature of people and how people take sides and it becomes like a, a wrestling match more so than people seeking the truth. Most of these debaters are not seeking the truth. They're seeking drama. Don't don't give them that drama, you know? Wallahu alam. Zakallahu khairan. There's a car that I think is blocking. Is it Again? blocking, Sheikh? That's what it is. K W 14 Z V A. So whoever's car it is, can they uh, move it, please? Wa jazakum Allahu khairan. Okay, I'm going to go through just a few. If I can go very, very quickly, I have a lot of questions, which means that my lesson was the one that I did, didn't. Yani, I didn't do a very good job of explaining. Uh, 47. When we say that the kuffar can't copy Muslims in their clothing and culture, then how can we say how can we stop them when we can't stop them from doing their shirk in the first place? That's a valid comment. There's no doubt. But we're talking here about for example, if a non-Muslim is living in a Muslim land and what he and he 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 does his prayer in his own house. He doesn't advertise, he doesn't show anything about it. That's one thing. But to allow him to come and wear the clothing of the Muslims and pray in public to his god that he prays to that is something different yani so that should be that should be clear inshallah ta'ala uh, the next question what are some of the etiquettes of the student of knowledge which many brothers are still missing and so this is a i, I thought this was an excellent question yani what would i advise well like these things i was very pleased with i was definitely pleased with people attending i'm pleased with people coming and sitting at the front i'm pleased with people taking notes It is important when the teacher's ready to start 
that you guys are sat down and listening. Don't let yourself come after the teacher comes to sit down. That's I think is very important. Well, lie. <laughs> And try not to discuss things among yourselves because even though it sounds quiet to you, it's not that quiet. Like there's still conversations going on on the side. So I would say these are from the etiquettes. And other than that, any maybe maybe we would say that and if we give you a break and say no questions, <laughs> for, uh, and sometimes there's a reason for it. Yani. Like and otherwise, wallahi, I think that the, the general behavior from the students was absolutely fantastic, and I have no complaints at all. Uh, just a couple, I'm just trying to balance it out by just taking, it, this takes me less time. But I think this is extremely important. What do you do when having doubts about Islam and about Allah? So we have to understand, first thing is first. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you, ple you plead with him and you beg him to guide you to the straight path. That before everything else, you don't need to find an alim before you go to ask someone. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show you. There was a mas'ala in, in Iqtidah Sirat al-Mustaqim. I didn't bring it, but the, I, I highlighted it, but we just ran out of time. And that is the issue of asking Allah to guide you in the things that you feel confused about. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that guide me to the truth in this issue. Don't let me get confused in it. It's very important. Now, as to what it relates to, the next step is that when you have confusion, you need to go to someone who is qualified to answer that confusion for you, just to help you to get through it. And as for letting it boil up inside of yourself, that's when it leads to confusion that is even greater. So you go and you ask someone. Now as for the case, it's also important to distinguish between al-wiswas, wiswas al shaytin the whispering of the shaitan, and what is a genuine shubha that a person has. Because sometimes shaitan is whispering, the person doesn't believe it in their heart. I don't believe this at all. This is just This is just whispering. I don't believe it. And then you can say, That is the true iman when a person pushes it away and says, I believe. I believe in Allah and His Messenger. I don't believe in any of this. That is a different situation to the person who genuinely says, I am honestly and genuinely confused about this issue. So do you see the difference? And when it's an issue that is just bouncing around in your head and you don't really believe it, what is required from you is to repel that belief, to affirm your belief in Allah and not to worry. But when you genuinely have a truly, you truly believe in that confusion, you need to go to a person of knowledge for that person of knowledge to uh, help you out with that. I almost I would really appreciate well if you had a few more points on that same question well I think you could add a benefit for the students would it be possible yeah. the person who has some doubts about Islam and about Allah <coughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> well in terms of these doubts people go through phases especially when you first start taking the religion seriously this is when you go through a phase where the shaitan will not leave you alone during Salah, before Salah, ideas, thoughts that that you, as the Sahaba said, that you would wish that you know you would fall from the sky before you even utter or even speak them out loud. And this is an indication that you have iman. You have to understand the Shaitan has a goal and objective. He's going to Jahannam. He wants to bring as many people as he can with him. If if you're not an accessible person for him in terms of you're not drinking alcohol, you're not you don't have a girlfriend, you know you're not do, you're not doing the things that will help him take you to Jannah. You're not a disbeliever in the first place. What is left for him to do? What is left for him to do? He has he has very limited access, and one of the things that will give him that easy access and throw someone off altogether is entering into the realm of or the area of whispers, these kind of uh, wasawis that are uh, problematic. The first thing is understanding that this is from the shaitan. People that have this al-waswas al-qahar, the type of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's a type of disorder where the shaitan is constantly harassing you. The first thing is you need to understand that you're being, uh, you're being affected by, by the shaitan. So don't, don't lose the, the plot and understand what's happening. This will help you deal with the issue. It's usually a matter of time before it goes away. Bi'ithnillah. It's a matter of time before it goes away. You seek refuge with Allah. By the way, in the salah, if this happens in the salah, you say, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. In the salah. And you be patient. This is one aspect. Generally speaking, the doubts about Islam, there are no doubts about Islam. 
there's nothing doubtful about Islam and thus there's nothing doubtful about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our religion is unlike any other religion our ideology is unlike any ideology what we have no one can even begin to dream about no religion on earth has a preserved book from Allah in the language of revelation that is recited by hundreds and thousands of people all over the world so much so that if the Quran was were to be burned if all the masahif were to be burned in this masjid we will write at the Quran again we'll bring some of the shabab who have the Quran memorized we have a few teachers over here if he makes one mistake with the tashkil half of the masjid will correct him we will be able to write the Quran from cover to cover what other religion can even make that allegation or claim they don't even know what's inside their books who else has a prophet whose lifestyle was recorded, his statements were recorded, how he put on his uh, sandals, alayhi uh, salam, how he put on his clothes, how he ate. There's no one, no one close. And the only religion that calls you to worship Allah alone, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I mean, it's, it's like the most basic, straightforward, logical, common sense uh, uh, package you could ever dream about. Nothing else makes more sense in this world. So anytime the shaitan tries to fool you with something like this, you just think to yourself, are you kidding me? There's no, there's no room to be doubting anything about Islam. No room whatsoever. It's a waste of time. What we should be doing is strengthening our knowledge so that we're able to uh, better explain those things which may appear to be confusing for, some, for, an, for an outsider. As for you, you're inside. You stay inside, inshallah. Uh, the car is still blocking KW14ZVA. Still, that car is blocking. What kind of car was it, Sheikh? Don't know. Okay. Is it uh, common that people memorize their license plates here? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, if you left your car blocking, then it's most likely that's the car, right? <laughs> so, no. Uh, Sheikh, I have سؤالا سؤال إن شاء الله الجواب يكون سريع بإذن الله تعالى والسؤال يحتاج إلى شيء من الوقت لكم أحسن الله إليكم شيخ السؤال الذي قد يكون جوابه سريعا إن شاء الله يعني هذا السؤال شيخ عن الصلاة خلف الإمام في المسجد البريلوي إذا لم يع إذا لم تعلم عقيدته يعني لا نعلم عن عقيدته شيء لكن هو إمام المسجد من مساجد البريوية هل نصلي خلفه وشيخنا هذا س... هذا إن شاء الله هذه مسألة مشكلة شوية <تصفيق> البريوية هذا رجل إذا كان في بدعته وعقيدته ما وصل الكفر السريع الشرك أكبر or kufr baba'ah idha lam tajid masjidan wa tusalli khalfahu wa khasatan idha lam ta'lam akidatahu ma huwa takunu salatuhu sahihan ikyun lennahu wa kana fasik wa usman bin affan radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal sallu kulla khalf fasikin wa fajirin al imam al bukhari rahimahullah yankul fi tarikhi al kabir أن أن ابن عمر وبعض الصحابة والطابعين كانوا يصلون خلف مختار ابن عبيد السقفي و هجاج هجاج من يوسف كان يعني بلغ إلى السماء في من في إتقاب منكراته أولا انظروا إذا كان أكيدته في بدته وصل إلى كفر والشرك الأكبر لا نصلي خلفه ولا أبراه وما إذا كان بدته ما وصل إلا إلى الفسق أو إلى لم يصل إلى الكفر إن شاء الله إذا لم جديد مسجدا إماء سلفيا أو إماما موحدا تصلي خلفه تكون الصلاة صحيحة إن شاء الله يكفي يكفي شيخنا أحسن الله إليكم وبارك فيكم the sheikh he said that in this situation if this person you know that they are the question did I not mention the question again can you pray in a brave masjid if you don't know the imam وخاصة جمعة وصلاة الإيد التي تحتاج إلى 
The Sheikh he said that first of all the question is can you pray in a bravery masjid if you don't know the Imam's aqidah, you don't know what that Imam believes, like it's a masjid from their masajid. So the Sheikh he said, first of all, if you know the person's aqidah has reached clear, undisputed disbelief, then this person you cannot pray behind them. But the Sheikh clearly said, he said clear, any unambiguous disbelief, then you can't pray behind them. But as for if it reaches the level of fisk, a kind of open defiance or an innovation that doesn't reach to that level, then he brought from the evidences of this, yani from the issues of, an uh, example, Abdullah ibn Umar that was narrated, uh, Bukhari narrated in, uh, in his tariq, uh, tariq al in his tariq al kabir that he narrated mm. So here the is, and it's narrated regarding any some of the, the Sahaba who prayed Abdullah ibn Umar and so on, who prayed behind some of the people that were known for defiance and disobedience and any extreme tyranny and things like that. So the Sheikh said if it reached the level of kufr, then there is no doubt about it that if you know that that person's belief has reached the level of unambiguous disbelief, then there is no issue of that. You cannot pray behind them. However, if it's less than that, and you don't find, now he said the Sheikh, okay, it's less than that. It hasn't reached the level of undisputed disbelief. Now, the question is, can you find another masjid which is not from those masajid? If you cannot find any other masjid, particularly the Jumu'ah and the Eid and the days where you need to be behind the Imam, then you can pray behind him and your prayer is valid, inshallah. That is, if you don't find, you can't, there's no other masjid that you can pray in, especially the Sheikh said the Jumu'ah and the Eid, the things that you have to be in the masjid for, then you can pray behind them if it only reaches the level of fisk and, and dis defiance and disobedience. Sheikh Su'al and Akhari Mkin. Sheikh, had Su'al, I think that the best way to answer this question is the Urdu language. Because the question is the best way to answer this question. Yes, yes, yes. ما هي الكتب التي تنصحنا نستفيد من كتب يعني الكتب اللغة الأردوية الكتب من القارئ الهندية كتب أهل العلم. So I'll translate the question, Sheikh, as well. Also, so this is a question for the Sheikh. I was asked, what's the books you recommend? Any the books in Urdu you recommend from the the scholars of the Indian subcontinent? So I said to the Sheikh, it's better for the Sheikh to answer that in Urdu because there's no to translate it will not really. Help us anything, any because the books originally is in the the Urdu language. Now, to follow. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subse pehli chiz to tarjim baat hai. Wala us ke liye shuri saare hindi. Ah, ashay ke jako ashay ke thi bhi kulo hada kulo hada li pehli li Urdu. Ah, dekho na hasan. Kai mabad hai. Number one. Subse pehle tauhid par agar kitab sikhni hai, kitab padhni hai. تو تقویت الایمان نمبر دو اور اسی طرح سے اور بہت ساری کتابیں ہیں اور کتاب التوحید بھی پہنچ گئی ہے اور اس سلسلے میں رسال نجاتیہ علامہ محمد فاخر ظاہر الہ آبادی کی بھی ہیں بہت ساری کتب اردو میں موجود ہیں عقیدے کے لیے اور کم سے کم اگر آپ حضرات عقیدے کے متعلق کچھ نہ ملتا ہو مشکات المسابی جلد اول کتاب الایمان مشکات المسابی کتاب الایمان کلم طیبہ سے لے کر کے تقدیر اور عذاب قبر تک سارے عقائد موجود ہیں اس میں نمبر دو فقہ میں یہ کہا جاتا ہے کہ اہل حدیثوں کے پاس کوئی فقہ نہیں ہے ایسی کوئی بات نہیں فقہ موجود ہے صحاب تابعین سب سے بڑے اہل حدیث امام شافعی تھے امام شافعی کی فقہ موجود ہے بات یہ اصل ہے کہ امام شافعی کی فقہ الگ تھی اور شافعیہ کی فقہ الگ ہے آدھا فرق ہے قبیر یہ بہت بڑا فرق ہے مثلا آپ ریاض الصالحین اٹھا کر کے دیکھیں ریاض الصالحین تو لکھا ہوا ہے کہ امام شافعی رحمت اللہ علیہ کے ہاں مرنے والے پر قرآن خانی کر کے سواب بخشنا امام شافعی کا نزدیک جائد ہے سمجھیں نا جائد ہے قرآن خانی کرنا بائی اتفاق علماء بائی اتفاق علماء یہ امام شافعی رحمت اللہ علیہ کے قول نہیں ہے 
बाद में शवाफे फेका उस फोका शाफिया ने जो बहुत सारे फरूआत निकाले सात सौ साल के बाद के फोका शाफिया ने लिखा कि ये कुरान खानी करके मुर्दे को इस साल सवाब पहुँचाना जाए दे तो यहाँ बात शाफिया की नहीं हो रही माम शाफी की हो रही असल किताब तो हमें चाहिए कि सबसे पहले अगर फोकहा में चाहते हैं उर्दू में चाहते हैं तो सबसे पहले पहली किताब उर्दू में फिक है मोहम्मदी फिक है मोहम्मदी एक अरसे तक पूरे बर शगीर कहले दीसों ने इसी किताब को पढ़ा किताब का ना फिक फिक है मोहम्मदी और इसके मुसनफ़ अलामा अबू मोहम्मद इब्राहिम आरवी रहमत महाजिर मक्की जिन्होंने बर शगीर के अंदर सबसे पहले दीनी मदारस को हासिल की शक्ल में कायम किया नंबर दो और इससे बेहतर चाहें चो तो शेख उलहदीस मौना अहमदुल्ला अब्दुलसलाम रहमत इस्लामी तालीमत तकरीबन ग्यारह जल्दों में इस्लामी तालीमत फिकहे पर लिखी गई है ये बहुत सारी किताबें हम चंद बताते हैं बास साहबा ने बास साथियों ने हमसे पूछा अगर अहल दीस उसूल फ़िका पढ़ाना हो तो क्या पढ़ें अहल दीस यहाँ कोई उसूल फ़िका की किताब नहीं वसूल फ़िक है ये असल में तारीख से नादा नहीं है नंबर एक इमाम शाफी रहमत ने बायदा वसूल फ़िका मुरतब किया अर साला और हैरत की बात है अर साला को छपाने वाला भी सबसे पहले अहल हदीस रिसाला तकरीबन एक हजार साल नहीं तेरह सौ साल तक पोशीदा थी लाइब्रेरी में इसको छपाया भी फिकह पर तो अहलेदी जालिम अलामा अहमद मोहम्मद शाकिर शारह मिशकत रहम ने तहकी के साथ छपाया वसूल फिका फिर उसके आगे बढ़े अलामा शातबी रहमत आ की तह वाज है वसूल फिका पर है और ये ऐसे अहले अहलेदीस आलिम थे हैं जिनकी बड़ी तवील दास्तान है इनशाला फिर किसी और मौके पर सारी दुनिया ने कहा ये बेदीन है इसी तरह से मेरे भाइयों अगर और आगे हम पढ़ें तो इमाम शौकानी रहमत ने इरशादुलफहूल इरशादुलफहूल फिर इल्मसूल किताब लिखी है और आगे हम पढ़ें तो इस इरशादुलफहूल का मुलखस एक है हसूलमूल है हम और आगे जब बढ़ते हैं तो शेख शाह इसमाइल शहीद रहमत आल ने भी उसूल फ़िका पर एक किताब लिखी है और आगे आप जाएंगे तो शेख उलनाम मोहम्मद सनाउल रहमत आल ने दो किताबें लिखी मोहम्मद हब अहल हदीस और एक है फ़िका फ़िक इन वसूलफ़िक तो अगर आप चाहते हैं वसूल फ़िका पढ़ना तो तकरीबन पचास सफ़े की किताब होगी शेख उलिस्लाम सनाउल्ला मरसली रहा तो अगर आप तफसीर पढ़ना चाहें तो मैं समझता हूँ सबसे पहली तफसीर जो मुफसल लिखी गई अहलदीस के यहाँ से वो तफसीर सनाई है नंबर दो आसन तफासीर है नंबर तीन आसन उलफवाद है नंबर चार तफसीर वहीदी है ये सारी किताबें उर्दू में हैं और मैं कहता हूँ अगर मतबू तफसरत को देखा जाए तो सबसे पुरानी तफसीर तफसीर वहीदी है और इससे भी आगे हम पढ़ें तो ताजुब की बात यह है अगर आप तफसीर की किताबें पढ़ना चाहें तो तकरीबन 20 जिल्दों के अंदर अलामा अमीर हसन लखनवी शागिद रशीद शेखुलकुल मियाँ नदी हुसैन मोहद्दी जेलवी की तकरीबन 30 जिल्दों के अंदर होगी और हर जिल्द तक एक हज़ार सफ़े की है आप जितना मुताला करना चाहें कर सकते हैं कोई फन ऐसा नहीं हैरत की बात ही लोग जानते नहीं अरबी सर्फ न हो अरबी सर्फ अरबी ग्रामर भी अगर अगर जैसे जाए तो ये ओलूम आलिया ओलूम आलिया इस ओलूम आलिया को भी अलहमदिल्ला अहल हदीसों ने मंतिक पर किताब लिखी फलसफर पर लिखी किताब नह लिखी किताब उशरफ लिखी मैं लिखे अलामा अब्दुलरहमान अमर सरी रहमत ने किताब उन्नव और किताब उशरफ दो उर्दू में लिखी 
اور اس وقت پوری دنیا میں انگریز حکومت تھی ان کو رئیس العلماء کا لقب دیا یہ دونوں کتابیں چھپی ہیں اور اکثر و بیشتر ہندوستان کے پاکستان کے دینی مدارس میں عربی ادب اگر اگر سیکھنا چاہیں تو سب سے بڑی کتاب اظہار العرب ہے پورے ہندوستان و پاکستان کے دینی مدارس میں پڑھائی جاتی اشعار اظہار العرب اس کے مصنف ہے محمد سورتی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ محمد بن یوسف اشورتی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ اور انہوں نے جب یہ عربی کتاب لکھی تکلیف ہے مشکل بافی مشکل الحمد <laughs> 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 علامہ محمد بن یوسف سورتی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ انہوں نے اتنے سرفنوں کہا جاتا ہے پچیس ہزار ان کو جاہلیت کے اشعار یاد کتنے خمسین الف اشعار خمسین الف اشعار محمد بن یوسف سورتی اور ان کو دیکھ لینے کے بعد بہت سارے لوگوں کے اشکال دور ہوگا کہا کہ ہم لوگ سمجھتے تھے بخاری اتنی حدیثیں کیسے یاد کر سکتا ہے ترمی دیت لاکھوں حدیثیں کیسے یاد کر سکتا ہے لیکن کہتے ہیں محمد بن یوسف سورتی سے جب ملاقات ہوئی تو یقین آ گیا کہ اس چودہویں صدی کے اندر اتنا آدمی کا حافظہ کبھی ہو سکتا ہے تو ان کا کیوں نہیں ہو سکتا الحمد انہوں نے کتاب لکھی اظہار العرب پچاس ہزار اشعار میں سے ملخص کیا اور پورے بر صغیر کے اندر لوگ جانتے نہیں یہ کتاب درس کے اندر ہے عربی ادب سکھلانے میں اور الحمد للہ سما الحمد للہ اور یہ جب حج کرنے کے لیے محمد بن یوسف سورتی رحمۃ اللہ نے تو ایک جگہ ان کیا کمال یہ تھا جس کنٹری کا عرب ہے اس کی زبان بولتے تھے بدوں میں جائیں تو بدو اور پڑھے لکھے ہیں تو پڑھے لکھے حالت یہ ہے کہ حج میں مینا کے اندر تھے پانی کی بڑی قلت تھی پانی لینے کے لیے گئے تو پانی لے رہے تھے اونڈے رہے سے تھے پیچھے علامہ رشید رضا مشری آئے ہوئے تھے ان کو نہیں پاتا ہے کون ہے تو انہوں نے کہا یا اللہ وہ اپنی مشری زبان استعمال کی انہوں نے جس کو کہتے شیر کا سوا شیر انہوں نے جواب دیا اور علامہ مشری کہتے یہ کون سی بلا ہے ہم جو عربی بولتے ہیں اسے بولتے ہیں انہوں نے اور عربی بولی اور انہوں نے عربی بولی آخر میں کہنے لگے من ائی والا دن اسعودیہ بحرین قطر کدھا و کدھا کال اللہ انا ہندی یون ہاں انتا ہندی انا امرا ہندی یون واللہ کہنے انہوں نے کہا انتا عدیب السما عدیب العصر کہتے ہیں اس کے بعد سے جب تک علامہ رسید رشید رضا مشری واپس نہیں گئے روزانہ عربی بولنے کے لیے محمد بن یوسف سورتی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ کے پاس آتے تھے اور یہی علامہ محمد بن یوسف سورتی نے شیخ الاسلام محمد بن عبد الوہاب نجدی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ جب حج کرنے کے لیے گئے تو محمد بن عبد الوہاب نجدی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ کی کتاب و توحید ڈھونڈ رہے تھے کتاب و توحید نہیں مل رہی تھی تو پتہ چلا کہ شیخ الاسلام محمد بن عبد الوہاب نجدی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ کی کوئی پوتی رہتے ہیں نجد میں ان کے پاس کتاب و توحید کا نسخہ ہے مدینے سے گئے اور اس کتاب کو نقل کیا اور نقل کرنے کے بعد لائے اور ہندوستان میں اس کا ترجمہ کر کے کتاب و توحید کا پہلا ترجمہ جی تھا الحمد میں سمجھتا ہوں جس کتاب کو جس فن میں آپ چاہ کہیں وہ بتائیں کس فن میں آپ کون سی کتاب چاہتے ہیں تو اس کی امداد کریں گے انشاءاللہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I don't only translate from Urdu I stick to Arabic but we do Urdu today inshallah right the question was um, which books do you recommend in the Urdu language uh, from the ulama of the subcontinent so he gave the, his answer in Urdu because that was more appropriate that's the people that he was addressing so he said it depends which it depends which Uh, subject are you talking about if you want Tawheed 
Then we have books like Taqwiyatul Iman, book that we studied. Likewise, we have an, uh, the, the translation of Kitab Tawheed. Likewise, we have so many other books in the Urdu language. And if you don't find any of the other books in the Urdu language, then you can study the book Mishkat al Masabih, which is a uh, hadith book. But if you study the first uh, Mujallad, the first volume, then in the first volume you have Kitab al Iman, the book of Iman. And in the book of Iman, the author <coughs> brings all those ahadith pertaining to the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, and goes through all of the topics until the Qadr, the decree of Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. That's in regards to Tawheed. If you want fiqh, then a lot of people like to say that Ahlul Hadith have no fiqh. But this is contrary to the truth. The, from the greatest Imams of Ahlul Hadith was Imam al Shafi'i. Uh, and when we say Imam al-Shafi'i, we are not referring to the Shafi'i madhab because the fiqh of Imam al-Shafi'i is different to the fiqh of the Shafi'iyya. For example, in the book Riyad al-Salihin written by Imam al-Nawawi, he mentions that Imam al-Shafi'i, according to him, reciting the Qur'an after a person passes away is permissible. However, by the agreement of all of the scholars, this is not from the statement of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. So even though Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah attributes it to the Shafi'i madhab, all of the ulama in agreement that this is not a statement of Imam al-Shafi'i uh, rahimahullah. In fact, about 700 years or uh, a few centuries later, after the passing of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, the ulama, the scholars of the Shafi'i madhab got together and they came to this uh, conclusion. Some of uh, the Sheikh mentioned a couple of books. The first book he mentioned, if you do want some simple books to study in the Urdu language, then there's a book called Fiqhi Muhammadi. The Fiqh of Muhammadi, i.e. those that follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was a book which throughout the whole subcontinent was uh, taught in all of the different madaris at one point in time. The second book that the Sheikh mentioned is authored by Sheikh Islam Abdul Salam, known as Islami Ta'limiyat. Uh, the Ta'limat. Uh, uh, Islamic teachings, which is in eleven volumes, so that is also a book of uh, a book of fiqh. If you want to move on to Usul al Fiqh, then again a lot of people say that the Madhu Ahl Hadith has no Usul al Fiqh. But if you look at the history of Usul al Fiqh, the first person to write a book in Usul al Fiqh was Imam al Shafi'i, rahimahullah, and he was from the people of Hadith. He wrote the book Al Risala, and not only that. But this book was hidden for a long time. It was hidden for a very long time. And the person who, re who republished this book by looking at his manuscripts and so on was also a person from the Ahl al-Hadith, which is Alam al-Muhaqqiq Ahmad Shakir, rahimahullah. Likewise, Imam al-Shatibi, rahimahullah, also has books in Usul al-Fiqh. Likewise, you have the book Irshad al-Fuhul, Fi Ilm al-Usul. Likewise, you have the summary of it, Husul al-Ma'mul. Likewise, Shah Ismail uh, Shaheed, the author of Taqwiyat al-Iman. He also has a book in uh, Usul al-Fiqh. Also, Shaykh al-Islam Allah, he has two books in uh, Usul al-Fiqh, uh, especially the one known as, he's got a book called Fiqh, i.e. Usul al-Fiqh, and that's in about 50 pages. If you want tafsir, then the first tafsir the Shaykh advises with is known as Tafsir Thana'i. And then Ahsanu al-Tafasir, which was the book that the Shaykh showed during the lesson. And then Ahsanu al-Fawaid, then Tafsir al-Wahidi. And Tafsir al-Wahidi is the most uh, oldest uh, of them and then if you want to look at Arabic grammar and uh, morphology sarf, nahu and sarf the ulama of the hadith have written in all of the sciences even in ulum al-alat even in those uh, sciences which are the tools instruments to help you understand the Quran and Sunnah so they have written in mantiq and uh, uh, philosophy why well, don't think they are ignorant of these uh, of what is said in regards to uh, these sciences, they know what's going on in these sciences um, as well. So there are many books um, in this. From those who have written a book is Muhammad ibn Yusuf al Surti. He wrote a book known as Adharul Arab. And this is a book which has all of the Arabic literature in regards to poetry from Jahiliya and all these different types of uh, poetry in there. And it is said that he knew over, uh, over 50,000 lines of poetry. And the people, they used to ask the question, that how was it that Imam uh, Ahmad rahimahullah, memorized a million hadith, Imam uh, Bukhari mem memorized 600,000 hadith, but then once we 
uh, met Muhammad uh, Yusuf uh, Surti, then we realize that it's very possible to memorize that number of uh, hadith. And this book was also a book which is taught throughout the subcontinent. Uh, and the Shaykh also mentioned that once the author, uh, Muhammad uh, Yusuf uh, Surti, he went for Hajj. And there was a lot of people for Hajj and they were looking for water because water was a bit scarce. So they went to the place for water and behind him was also uh, Ahmed Rashid Rida. And he was behind him and he was basically telling, he didn't know who, who the Sheikh was, so he was telling him to get out of the way and he said, Yalla ruh. And those, you know, that basically means like, move out of the way. And then the author, or the Sheikh, he replied to him with, po with Arabic poetry. So he was taken back, so he asked, what nationality are you? Are you Saudi? Are you from Bahrain? Are you from Kuwait? Are you from Gulf country? Are you Egyptian? What, what are you? And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm Indian. And he was shocked and he was taken back by this so much that he said that every single day he would go out looking for him just so he could practice speaking the Arabic language uh, with him. Likewise, uh, another scholar was, he went for Hajj and he was looking for Kitab al Tawheed by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Wahhab. Rahimahullah. And he was searching and searching, searching, and he couldn't find any copies until he had heard that one of the grandsons of the uh, of Shaykh Muhammad Wahhab rahimahullah, he had a copy in Mecca. So he was in Medina at the time, he traveled all the way to Mecca, he got a hold of a granddaughter. Granddaughter, granddaughter had a uh, copy. So he went all, all the way to Mecca, he found that copy, and then he went back. When he went back, he translated Kitab al Tawheed, and this was the first translation of Kitab al Tawheed into the Urdu language. So the Shaykh he, he summarized in the end by saying that a lot of people want to attack Ahlul Hadith for not having books. Our reply is, which science are you talking about? Give us any science and we'll start giving you lists of books after books after books. Jazakallah <laughs> <laughs> mubarakallah Yeah, I think you passed, man. I have no idea if you passed, but it sounded good. Allah, <laughs> jazakallah <laughs> uh, khayran. Okay, two questions for Ustad Abu Mus'ab that the two questions are connected to each other. Uh, one is a question, if my mother leaves Islam, can my children be around their grandmother, i.e. his mother, who left Islam? That's the first one. And then I'll give you the second one, which is related, but I'll give you that one first. So his mother left Islam. Now he's asking about his children keeping ties with her or being around her after she left Islam. <coughs> there are two possible scenarios. Either she's <coughs> aggressive in her rejection of Islam and is, uh, you know, is is actively trying to influence your children, or she's just uh, docile. She left Islam on her own accord, and she's still a grandmother that deserves. The, the you know not to sever the kinship ties with her so if if there's no harm in keeping the kinship ties with her and perhaps trying to bring her back to islam then then that's expected but only if in, only if it's a situation where keeping kinship ties with her will result in her trying to sh you know uh, affect the children negatively trying to poison their minds, trying to influence them about their belief and so on and so forth, then ultimately you, you don't uh, give the children access to their grandmother. Ultimately, 100%, because protecting their Iman takes precedence over anything else. Uh, and so you, you would be able to answer that question depending on, on the condition uh, at home. Wallahu alam. So the second question, Jazakallah khairan, the second question yeah. is somewhat related, so it's to do with this time with uh, siblings. <laughs> Mm. who have gone astray because of the s school system and social media exposure and how do we call them back to yeah, any back to Islam or back to practicing Islam all right the siblings are a little easier to deal with um, <laughs> unless you have an ongoing beef ever since you were children I know some siblings uh, yeah, the, the, the amount of hatred they have for each other you would think that you brought them from separate families and they, they had to live together for whatever reason um, I hope that's not the case, uh, but the siblings are easier to access because there are usually a lot of commonalities at home. Um, look, 
the most effective the most effective advice you will ever give will be the one from your heart will be the one where you're not screaming at that person you're not mad at them you're not scolding them is one where you sit down and you pour your heart out and share how concerned you are for them and how much you love them and how much you worried about their hereafter that's really the most effective way a lot of us can't get ourselves to do that for whatever reason uh, we feel maybe it's a sign of weakness or we're shy or ego where we don't we don't we just want to uh, you know like a boss at work like a manager issuing commands and direction to the people you do this you do that you don't do this you don't do that it's usually not effective sit down with them like Ibrahim told his father yeah Abati he kept calling him by uh, by a name that would be that shows compassion love care and concern before he reached the point where he knew that there was no hope show them this kind of compassion and love in in sharing the message in trying to guide them back to Islam if you think that by doing so you're going to distance them even further they're going to be repelled then don't use an outsource sometimes you need to outsource the da'wah let someone else do the job on your behalf this is often the case between children and their parents parents don't want to take advice from their children even if they know that the children are right and they are wrong there's something that makes them difficult for them to to be told by their own child that you're right you know you're, you're not right or that you're wrong so if you're in this predicament, you want to outsource. Let someone else who has such authority, has access, he has uh, you know, impact on them, come do the job. Lastly, if a verbal confrontation is um, ineffective, write a letter or an email. Use a non-confrontational means of communication. People usually are more receptive to hear a letter, to read a letter where you, you begin it by expressing your love and your care for them, where you're not putting them under the pressure of you telling them and them having to react. It usually is more effective than having to hear you tell them to their face. Try all these methods. Of course, after we already assume from what Sheikh Muhammad said earlier, you make dua. This is the same way you make dua for yourself, for Allah to teach you something. You make dua for them, for Allah Azza wa to guide them. You make an effort. And you understand all, all, all along, you don't guide those who you love, Allah guides those who, those whom He wills. So you have that in the back of your mind. That if it doesn't work, it's not your fault per se. This is just the qadr of Allah. Wallahu alam. Sheikh Hatifa, there's a question for Sheikh Tafar. It's really good. But uh, can you translate it? And then can you translate the answer? <laughs> yeah. How this one? I can ask Sheikh Arabic because why well, you did such a good job, you did such a good job, Sheikh. I feel like now that I just I feel like it's like redundant. So you can ask me. You can ask the Sheikh Arabic then. Sheikh, this question, this Sheikh, I hope you can answer it. How did the Qara Hindi, meaning from يعني أن كانت يعني دارا للإسلام إلى دار الهندوسيين هؤلاء وكذلك هل من الصحيح أن الديوبندية كانوا يعني أو تسببوا في المحافظة على الإسلام في القارة الهندية في وقت معين من الأوقات واضح السؤال شيخنا واضح بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ديرتك وإحنا فارقة خلاصة راضيه ريدي پہلی چیز تو دو سوال ہیں نمبر ایک کیا فرق دیوبندیا نے ہمیشہ ہندوستان میں اسلام کی حفاظت کے لیے ساری قربانیاں دی ہیں یا نہیں ہیں حد ہوا سوال ہاں تو اس سلسلے میں پہلی چیز تو یاد رکھیں کہ تقریباً چار چوتھی صدی ہجری تک چوتھی صدی ہجری تک صرف 
ساحلی علاقوں یا اس کو مضافات میں صرف اہل الحدیث تھے انہوں نے دین کی حفاظت کیا اور لوگوں کو دین پہنچایا عرب تجار گئے عرب تجار گئے محبت قاسم گیا اور مدینہ طیبہ سے سری لنکا کا نام آپ لوگوں نے سنا ہوگا سری لنکا کے راجا نے خواب دیکھا کہ عرب میں کوئی بہت بڑا دانشور پیدا ہوا ہے تو اس نے اپنا ایک وفد بھیجا بت پرستوں کا جاؤ مدینہ جاؤ مکہ جاؤ مکہ اس لیے مشہور تھا کہ لوہی کے سامان لوہی کے سامان تلوار چھورا چاقو فاوڑا نیزا یہ اسلحے اور مس نمبر دو مسالہ مسالہ یعنی مرچ دھنیا اور کیا کہتے ہیں وہ اسپائسی ہاں یہ ساری چیزیں ہندوستان سے آتی تھیں تو ہندوستان کی بہت بڑی مارکیٹ تھی مکہ مکہ آنے کے بعد پھر ادھر شام اور کیا کہتے ہیں یورپ تک سپلائی ہوتا تھا انڈیا کا سامان اسی لیے نبی علیہ السلام جو گفتگو کرتے اس میں بھی کہیں جگہ جگہ ہندی لفظ ہے مثال کے طور پر آپ نے فرمایا شاہ ملک الملوک کا ترجمہ اللہ فرما شاہن شاہ یہ خاص اصطلاحی ہندوستان کے اردو آ رہے شاہن شاہ یہ نبی علیہ السلام کی زبان مبارک سے ایک عورت اللہ سے پوچھا درد زہست تمہارے پیٹ میں درد ہے کیا اللہ اکبر یہ سارے الفاظ تھے کہ ہندوستانی کلچر وہاں پہنچا تھا تو سری لنکا کے بعد شاہ نے کچھ تحفے تحائف دے کر کے مکہ بھیجا مکے آئے وفد آیا تو سالوں لگتا تھا نبی علیہ السلام ہجرت کر کے مدینہ طیبہ آ گئے تھے مدینہ طیبہ وہ وفد پہنچا اور وہ وفد مسلمان ہوا مسلمان ہو گیا لیکن جب واپس جانے لگے سری لنکا کے لوگ داہد ساحلی کنارے سے تو پتہ چلا وفد کے واپس پہنچنے کے پہلے پہلے اس بادشاہ کا انتقال ہو گیا تھا نمبر دو آج کا جو بلوچستان ہے وہاں کا ایک وفد آیا مسلمان ہونے کے لیے نبی علیہ السلام صاحب سے ملاقات کیا اور ملاقات کر کے جب واپس جا رہا تھا تو اس میں کچھ لوگوں نے وہیں بلوچستان میں قیام کیا اور وہاں اسلام کی دعوت تو اس طرح سے پورے اہل حدیث اسلام کا تحفظ کیے تھے لیکن چار سو تقریباً تین سو پچہتر یا تھری ہنڈریڈ سیونٹی فور یا سیونٹی تھری میں جب اہناف آئے ہیں تو انہوں نے دین کی حفاظت نہیں کیا نہ قرآن کے نفیس کی انہوں نے حفاظت کیا اپنے مذہب فقہ حنفی کی اس کے علاوہ کوئی چیز انہوں نے نہیں کیا نہ کوئی تحفیظ القرآن کا مدرسہ چھوڑا نہ کھولا نہ درس حدیث کا کوئی انتظام کیا نہ ہندوؤں میں دعوت و تبلیغ کا کوئی کام کیا آئے تو صوفیوں نے کچھ بنایا ہندو عزم سے نکال کر کے صوفت میں لٹکا دیا نہ ادھر کرے نہ ادھر کے نہ خدا ملا نہ خدا ہی ملا نہ وشال صنم نہ ادھر کرے نہ ادھر کہیں کہ نہیں بیچ میں بشارے رہ گئے رہتے گئے لیکن الحمد للہ عثمان بن ابن ابی لاش بھی آئے تو انہوں نے ساحلی علاقے میں اسلام پھیلایا اسلام کا تحفظ نہیں بلکہ خصوصی اپنے فقہ حنفی کا تحفظ کیا الحمد للہ لیکن پورے ہندوستان میں جب یہ عام ہو گیا تو ان کے پاس نہ قرآن تھا نہ حدیث تھا فقہ تھی اور منطق اور فلسفہ ایران کے ذریعے تو اب ایران مسلمہ ایسے رہ گئے کہ نہ ان کا عقیدہ درست ہوا نہ کچھ اور معاملہ ہوا اس وقت سے لے کر کے اہناف نے ہمیشہ صرف دوستوں تحفظ کیا ہے مذہب حنفی فقہ حنفی کے لیے اب وہ کہتے ہیں دوسرے سوال کا جواب کہتے ہیں کہ ہمیشہ سے انیس سو دو ہزار دو میں دو ہزار دو میں تحریک چلی تھی ہندیا پاکستان کے اندر تحفظ سننا تحفظ سننا یا تحفظ شریعت وہ تحفظ شریعت نہیں تھی بلکہ وہ اصل میں تھی تحفظ حنفیت تھی اور اہل حدیثوں کو برا بھرا کہنا ان کو 
قل عدم قرار دینا اس موقع پہ اعلان کیا کہ ہمیشہ سے ہندوستان میں ہندوستان میں اسلام کی حفاظت اہناف نے کی ہے اور اسی مضمون کا لیٹر لکھ کر کے پورے عرب علماء کے پاس بھیجا گیا بہرحال یہ انہوں نے کیا لیکن الحمدللہ اسلام کو جو تحفظ کیا کتاب و سنت کا اس وقت سے لے کر کے آج تک اہل حدیثوں نے کیا اور اکبر نے جو دین بگاڑا تھا اس میں بھی آپ دیکھیں گے کسی دیوبندی دیوبند و تائین کسی حنفی عالم کو کوئی کردار نہیں دارا نظر آتا نظر آتا ہے تو شیخ احمد مجدی سرہندی اور اس کے بعد الحمدللہ جب شاہ ولی اللہ آئے شاہ ولی اللہ کے بعد شاہ اسماعیل آئے اور اس طرح سے جب جہاد شروع کیا تو دوبارہ الحمدللہ اسلام کا تحفظ ملا اور آج قیامت تک انشاءاللہ اب دوبارہ ہندوستان میں سرک اور بیدات غلبہ نہیں ہوگا دن بدن اہل عدیث کا غلبہ ہو رہا ہے اور ایک دن وہ آئے گا کہ نبی علیہ السلام کا فرمان کے مطابق اسلام جھو پڑوں میں گھروں میں گھسرے گا چاہے راضی ہو کر کے یا زلیل ہو کر کے لوگوں گھسرے گا انشاءاللہ Okay, this one I'm going to summarize a bit more. Uh, huh? So the, the question is, um, how did the Indian subcontinent go from Islam to Hinduism? And is it true that Deobandis aided the preservation of, uh, of Islam at one point uh, in that land? Um, the Sheikh said, until the fourth... Islam is the name of Islam? Islam is the name of Islam? اسلام اسلام کہتے ہیں غور سے سنیں اللہ تعالیٰ اپنے نبی کو جو پیغام دے کر کے دنیا میں لو ان سو جن کی ہدایت کے لئے بھیجتے ہیں کتاب اس سنت کے شکل اسی چیز کا نام کیا ہے اسلام اسلام نام ہے کتاب اس سنت کی شکل میں اللہ بندوں کی ہدایت کے لئے جو پیغام بھیجتا ہے اسی پیغام کا نام ہے اسلام اب پورے دنیا میں جو کتاب و سنت ہی کا علم بردار ہوگا اسی کو کہا جائے گا اسلام کی حفاظت کر رہا ہے کسی اور علمی کے دریئے حفاظت نہیں ہو سکتی کتاب و سنت کو چھوڑ دینے کے بعد شرکی کی حفاظت ہوگی تازیہ کے ہوگی درگاہ کے ہوگی مدار کے ہوگی لیکن مجھے سلم کی سنت کی نہیں ہوگی اسلام کی نہیں ہوگی اینام اوکی سو دے شیخ منشند ان رگارز تو ان دے بگننگ Uh, in the first few centuries, um, shirk and all these issues were very few because many of the Sahaba and Tabi'in, they had gone there and the Ahlul Hadith who were there at the time, they were preserving and protecting the religion. So even when Arab uh, tradesmen would come from Medina and so on to all these different places, it was always Ahlul Hadith or ulama who were uh, defending the uh, religion and giving da'wah and, uh, and so on. And then the Sheikh mentioned uh, a couple of incidents of how um, different caravans and different uh, businesses would travel from different places, from Sri Lanka to, uh, to Mecca and to other places. And the summary of all those stories is that it would be that whenever they would go and due to the scholars of Al-Hadith and the da'wah and the druze taking place, many of them who were non-Muslim would accept Islam through their, uh, through their uh, da'wah. But then if you look towards the you know, fourth century onwards, when more of the Ahnaf, uh, the Hanafiya uh, came in, especially through the areas of Iran and so on, they did not preserve anything from the religion, not in regards to Quran, so they never had Tahfiz uh, al-Quran, those gatherings and circles of where they would memorize Quran and so on, nor even of Hadith. The only thing that they would preserve is the Hanafi fiqh. The only thing that they would be preserving would be the Hanifi fiqh and those sciences pertaining to that such as mantiq uh, and, and so on. As for memorization of the Quran, memorization of a hadith, study of a hadith, even da'wah to the Hindus and so on, uh, this was non-existent uh, with them. However, um, if you were to look throughout the history, even the history of the Sheikh mentioned during our lessons of Taqwiyat al-Iman, even the fitna of al-Akbari, who was it? Who, was, who are the ones who stood up uh, against that fitna? And who are the ones who defended the Quran and Sunnah? It was the ulama of Ahl al-Hadith. And the ulama of Ahl al-Hadith, even though it may seem now that it's becoming a bit less and less people uh, know about their efforts and so on, without a doubt, all these other innovations on all these other um, 
things which oppose the methodology of Ahl Hadith, even if they become prevalent now, then they will eventually go. And the only thing which will remain is the madhab of Ahl Hadith. Because, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the Hadith, that eventually Islam will enter into every single household. But what is the meaning of Islam? What is the meaning of Islam? Islam is that religion which was sent to the Prophet ﷺ to convey to the people for their guidance. That's the religion of of Islam and that, and that guidance is based, based upon what? It's based, based upon the Quran and the Sunnah of his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how can the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the religion of Islam, so therefore how can Islam be preserved except by the scholars of, of Hadith? It cannot be uh, preserved by other than them. No. Okay, I think this question might be nice for us to ask everyone a little bit any from it. Uh, the question is, how have we start with the uh, Ustaz Abu Musab, inshallah. How you found visiting Bradford and what kind of impression do you have of the, the Muslims and the, and the students that you've seen here so far? Bradford or Bradford? <laughs> well, to be frank, I don't know, a few months ago, I don't know how long it's been. I didn't even know Bradford existed in the world. Until, up until the Dio Bundy stunt. Uh, there was that, Dio Bundy, it's a long story, a Sheikh. But I didn't know, actually. Baskar Babai, the Hafsta. Yeah, the Kalibas. No, I actor my Kalibas, a Sheikh. But I'm Kalibas, he's Dio Bundy. Obviously, put yourself in my shoes. You're, you're coming from, from a different country to a community of people. Uh, you can imagine from where you are what it will be like. And you have expectations, right? Because alhamdulillah, I've traveled a few places, so I, 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 have, I have something to compare to. It's not like... So I had an expectation, and, and you exceeded my expectation by like a, a big margin, mashallah, tabarakallah. And... Um, Genuinely speaking, I'm, I, I can't believe, I don't, I don't know, it's been four days. It feels like it's been four hours. Um, it's a very, uh, very welcoming community. I feel, like, I feel like I know you guys, but I don't, I don't. At least you make me feel like I know you. Or maybe you know me, so you make me feel like I know you. I feel very welcomed. I feel very happy. Um, uh, generosity, kindness. And, and most importantly, your, your uh, interest in, in learning and your keenness. On, on and being consistent. MashaAllah, this is a, a, long, a, long, a lot of hours per day. It's a lot of hours per day. The fact that I see you in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, at night, before we go to sleep, is, is pretty amazing. Uh, so may Allah Azza wa Jal reward you all. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I have a lot more to say, but I don't want to be selfish and you know, just take the mic from the mashayikh. So, yeah, Zakum Allah Khairan. وليكم نفس السؤال يعني كيف وجدتم الأخوة في برادفورد وكيف يعني كيف تجدون الطلبة ونصيحة لهم شيخ ها برضو والله ولا تعب تعب خير إن شاء الله والله پہلی چیز تو ہی کہ من لم یشکر اللہ سلم یشکر اللہ یہ تقریباً میرا خیال ہے پندرہ سال ہو گئے یو کے آتے ہوئے اور ہمیشہ الحمدللہ ہفتے دو ہفتے رہتے ہیں مختلف علاقوں میں حقیقت تو ہے کہ ہمیں دلی فرحت و مسررت اور بھئی ایک بزنس وہاں جہاں جاتا ہے اگر اس کا بزنس اچھا چلا تو اس کی صد بڑے خوشی بہی ہے طالب علم آتا ہے پڑھنے کے لیے علم حاصل کر لے وہ سب خوشی ہے ہم ہیں شاہد ٹمبل ہیں اور باشا اللہ یہ ہم سارے لوگ آئے ہیں آئے ہیں کہ بھائی کچھ دین کی باتیں بتائیں اور آپ لوگ لوگ سنیں اور ایک اچھا اثر پیدا ہو یہ ہماری کامیابی ہے تو پورے تقریبہ پندرہ سولہ سال میں سب سے اچھا سفر دعوت کے اعتبار سے بیریٹ فورٹ کا آج یہ ہے اصل میں جتنا شوق سے لوگوں نے سنا اور جتنا ہمیں بھی کہنے میں مزا آیا سیدھی سے بات ہے 
और जो एक उसमें हमारे भाइयों का बेट पहले पहले ब्रेट फोर्ट हाँ कहा है और हमारे साथी शेख तीम हम्बल और हमारे वशाय का खसूस शेख का भी इसमें बड़ा हाथ है अल्लाह ताला आइंदा भी इसे हमारी और आपको मुलाकात कराए हमने इल्मी तौर पर देखा कि इतना फ़ायदा कभी नहीं हुआ था शायद कॉन्फ्रेंस में जितना फ़ायदा आज हुआ इस कॉन्फ्रेंस से हुआ अकीदा मनाहज तालीम नंबर दो आ, मैंने ये देखा अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह लो हमारे बड़े शगीर के लोगों का एक मिजाज है कि किसी को दीन सीखना है तो मदरसे में जाके दाखिला ले एडमिशन ले दीनी मदरसे में लेकिन हमने तकरीबन खलीज में पचास साल से हैं दुबई में वहाँ दरुस् से और यहाँ आने के बाद हमने हमें हम तजर्बा हुआ नहीं ये फिक्र बिल्कुल गलत है दीन सीखने के लिए मदारिस होना ज़रूरी है लेकिन आला तालीम के लिए अवामी सतह पर अवामी सतह पर आवाम को दीन से जोड़ने और उनकी जहालत दूर करने के लिए ये मसाजिद और इस तरह से ओलू में दरुस् इलमिया और इस तरह की कॉन्फ्रेंस सबसे ज़्यादा मुफीद होती हैं मुफीद होती हैं तो अलहमदिल्ला हर एक के चाहे अरबी जानने वाला हो या माशा इंग्लिश जानने वाला हो हम जो कह रहे थे चेहरे से पता चल रहा था कि जो नहीं समझ रहा वो भी खुश हो रहा है ये जो मैंने देखा तो इसका मतलब है कि हाँ वो तर्जमे का इंतज़ार करते रहे होंगे कि तर्जमा होगा या हमारे इशारे से कुछ समझ में आता रहा होगा या टूटी फूटी टेलफाज में कुछ लेकिन अंदाज़ा लगा कि जैसे प्यासे कहीं पानी को देखने के लिए बड़े हिर्स के साथ इंतजार करें और या फूक लेगी हो तो खाना रख के रख दिया जाए तो बार बार उस पर निगाह डालें उससे कहीं दादा अगला जुमला क्या कहा जा रहा है उस पर लोगों की तवज्जो थी तो ये पता पता चल गया कुल आलिमन और मुतमन और मुस्तम वला तकुन अराबन अल्लाह ताली ने बहुत ही खुशी का मौका दिया और बहुत अच्छी इकबाल इकबाल यानी ओलूम शराइया की तरफ तोज्जो बहुत ज़्यादा हमने देखी हर इंसान बूढ़े से ले कर के जवान तक और मैं कभी नहीं भूल सकता लंदन के तीन बच्चे जो आए चले गए परसों हाजत उनके घर वाले उनकी तबीयत खराब हुई बस इतने बड़े बच्चे थे लेकिन हर बच्चा जो है नोट किया बहुत खुश आ कर के बाद भी मिलता था किसका माना क्या है परसों देखा यहाँ एक साहब अपने दो बच्चों के लेके बैठे हुए हैं सुबह अल्लाह इमाम अबू दाऊद रहमत ला की सुन्नत याद आ गई इमाम अबू दाऊद रहमत ला जब इल्म हासिल करने के लिए जाते तो अपने साथ अबू दाऊद अब अब्दुल्ला छोटा बेटा था उसको ले उसको भी घसीटते रहे उसको भी घसीटते रहते सर पर किताबों का गटर होता पीठ पर पानी का मशक होता बोझा और अपने बेटे अब्दुल्ला कैसे हाथ पकड़ के लिए घसीटते चलते बेटा छोटा था तब थक जाता बाप अबू दाऊद रहमत घसीटते जाते बहुत परेशान हुआ एक आदमी सामने से आ रहा था तो उसने कहा बड़े मियाँ कम से कम तुम कहाँ जा रहे हो कहा मैं इल्म हासिल करने के लिए जा रहा हूँ कहा इस बच्चे को क्यों घसीट रहे इस बच्चे को अपनी इसके माँ के पास छोड़ दिए होते बेचारे को ये बच्चा थक जाएगा इतना तो इमाम अबू दाऊद ने कहा ये मेरा बेटा है लोगों को मालूम नहीं थे कि अबू दाऊद है ये अबू दाऊद कहने लगे कि ये मेरा बेटा है मुझे आपसे ज़्यादा फिक्र है लेकिन मैं इसको इसलिए साथ लेके जा रहा हूँ छोटा सा बच्चा है बड़े बड़े उलमा बड़े बड़े मुहदसिन हैं है? कहीं ऐसा न हो कि बच्चा बड़ा होने के इंतजार देखें ये बड़े उलमा ख़त्म हो जाए हो जाए हमारा बच्चा इन बड़े बुजुर्गों के और मुहदसिन के दीदार और सोहबत और दुआओं से महरूम रह जाए इसलिए मैं अपने बच्चे को लेके जा सुबह अल्लाह वल्लाह कल मैंने मेरे आंखों में आंसू आ गए वहीं एक आदमी बैठा और दोनों तरफ एक बच्चे की मुश्किल से आठ साल उम्र और दूसरे के ज्यादा दस साल है लेकिन एक एक जुमला वो लिख रहे थे इसका मतलब है कुल्लु सगीर व कबीर नमा मिला है हर एक ने दिलचस्पी ली और अल्लाह तला से दुआ करें अल्लाह मस्जिद फजिद सुम मस्जिद हाँ अल्लाह और शौक दे और दे और बढ़ाए और हमारे शेख भाई को भी मजीद टाउन की तोफ़ी नफ नसीब फरमाए और हमारे ये जो ग्रेट फोर्ट वाले हैं अलहमदिल्ला इनके जुस्तजू को कबूल फरमाए लेकिन इसको इंतहा न समझे इसको इब्तदा समझे ठीक है ना भाई सारा नुकसान होता है जब इंतहा समझ लिया जाए इसको आप इब्तदा समझें 
اور آئندہ بھی ایسے کرتے رہیں ممکن ہے کہ ایک بڑا انقلاب آ جائے اللہ ہم سب کو ملک کی توفیق نصیب فرمائے اقول قولی حادہ واسطر اللہ من کل دم میں مات ہوئی بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سو شیخ خدا سے سیم کوششن اور دیجئے سنکھ اور براد فرد So he said, firstly, as per the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that whomsoever does not thank the people, then he has not thanked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And he said, I always come to the UK, I come nearly every year, I've been coming for about 15 uh, or so years, and I always come for a week or two, and I'm always delivering lectures in different masajid, and so on. But when, just like a businessman, if he goes to another place and he sees people, benefiting from his business and he sees his business thriving then he is happy so likewise when we come here we have come all the way here to try to teach people their religion so when we see likewise students of knowledge have come and left their busy lives and they have come and they've sat down and they're taking notes and benefiting from what we are saying then that is also something which brings pleasure to the hearts i've been coming for over 15 years and I can easily say that this visit of mine was the best travel that I've had over all of these 15 years. And the, the hirs, the zeal, and the encouragement, and how eager, the eagerness that I've seen in all of the students is something which really brings uh, a lot of uh, contentment to the heart. And ask Allah SWT to allow us to gather us again like this many times again in the future. And from all of my visits, in terms of a knowledge-based benefit in terms of the academic benefit given to the people then without a doubt this trip was the one where academically uh, knowledge-based benefit was the most we were studying aqidah we were studying manhaj we were studying islamic knowledge and our people in the some continent we normally have a, a way of thinking which is that if somebody wants to study anything about islam that the only way he can do so is by sending him to the madrasa, to the Islamic schools. However, even through our practical experience of giving da'wah in Dubai and in, uh, across the world, it's clear that this way of thinking is completely incorrect. Yes, these Islamic institutes may be suitable for more higher and technical learning, but without a doubt, for the general masses, then the masajid and these halaqat and these academic lessons are the most beneficial thing for the general public and subhanallah i could see people from you know different places i could, i knew there were people who didn't understand urdu there were people who only spoke arabic there were people who only spoke english but even with that i could see on their faces that they were happy even if they didn't understand what i was saying either they were eagerly anticipating the translation to understand or they could understand some of the Isharat, some of the indications that I was doing or maybe there were a couple of buzzwords that they understood or maybe there was a couple of words that in my broken English I said and you could see the excitement uh, and the anticipation on their face it was as though the, there were thirsty people just looking at a cup of water waiting for it to be given to them and as some of the Salaf they said be a scholar or be a student or be somebody who listens to that knowledge and do not be the fourth type of person, i.e. none of these three. And I saw that there were three youngsters who came from London. Now I think they've gone back because they had some things to do. They would always be attending the lessons and after every lesson they would always meet me. I saw uh, one brother come with his small little young uh, daughters and they would sit down in the lessons. And this reminded me of the story of Abu Dawood. How Abu Dawood, the one who wrote the Sunan, the, the great Muhaddith, that when he would travel for knowledge, he would always take his son Abdullah with him. And they weren't just walking, but they were, they were carrying their books, they were carrying water, they were carrying all of their uh, luggage, all of their, their, their things, everything that they needed. And obviously him being a young boy at the time, he was getting tired as well. You know, the adults would get tired, so the boy would get tired as well. So as Imam Abu Dawood, rahimahullah, as he was traveling, uh, a man stopped them and asked, you know, where are you going with all this luggage and all of these things that you have? And he said, and this person didn't know that it was Imam Abu Dawood. But he just said, I'm going to seek knowledge. So this person replied, that just leave the kid with his mom. You're making him go through all of this hardship uh, for no reason. And his answer was, uh, firstly, you know, he's my son. I know 
how much he's able to bear. I'm not over, uh, overburdening him. However, at the same time, there are so many senior scholars who are alive today. You know, from the students, from the teachers of Abu Dawood, Imam Muhammad and others. So there are so many senior scholars alive today. And I do not want that when he grows up and he's a bit stronger and he's able to travel by himself, I don't want him to turn around and think that he was deprived from benefiting from these scholars. So subhanAllah, what was happening in this Dora was reminding me of the stories of the Salaf uh, like this. I saw somebody with the daughter who was 8 year old, uh, or the children who were 8 year old, the other was 10 year old. But both of those kids were writing down every single sentence that I was writing. So without a doubt, this is from you know, the best um, travel and visit that I have done. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from all of us and to grant us all uh, success. And finally, the Shaykh, he just said that all of what we've done, don't think this is the end. This is just the beginning. This is just something which is going to start that battery, start that uh, light, that spark for you to carry on learning in the future, revise what we've already taken and keep learning and so on. If you think this is the end, then that knowledge what you've just taken is going to go. But this is only the beginning and inshallah will benefit a lot more in the future. Inshallah. Is that it? Okay. Okay, with that, uh, alhamdulillah, we've come to uh, the conclusion of this uh, Dora. There are a couple of uh, words which I didn't want to mention, which is that, you know, for those people that don't know, this masjid, alhamdulillah, and I believe Sheikh Zafar, I believe in his, if I remember correctly, his first lecture did allude uh, to this point, which is a struggle that our elders went through in establishing this masjid. And this uh, masjid initially is just you know, behind those doors is a madrasa area. That was just a masjid, just a small little house. And now, subhanAllah, you can see the size of the masjid, you can see the benefit of the masjid, and so on. And this masjid is the first purpose-built Ahlul Hadith masjid in the UK. So, therefore, we need, you know, it's very important that we um, take time out to, to thank those, you know, some of the founders are still here, many of them have passed away and also make dua for them and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everything which is taking place all the goodness which is taking place in this masjid is all in their scales of good deeds likewise I want to thank all of the asatidah and the mashayikh who took their time out traveled you know all, all three of them they've come from abroad right and some of them arrived while on the day of the dora and on that same day they came and and, 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 and they taught as well so it's a lot of effort that they put in, never mind the hours and hours of uh, preparation uh, before that. So we have to thank them uh, for uh, taking out the, their time and allowing us to benefit uh, from them. Likewise, all of the brothers and sisters, all of the volunteers, everyone who helped in facilitating uh, and allowing this to be a very successful uh, conference. With that, as the Sheikh said, you know, this is you know, one of the best uh, dawrat and, and of the Sheikh, he said is best. Uh, visit where we benefited uh, the most and finally and subhanAllah is my mistake this should be the first thing is that we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, because he is the one who facilitated everyone and everything to do uh, what they what they did and finally any failures any shortcomings any mistakes uh, you know I'm, I'm sure you know, there's a lot of people I'm sure at least there's one person two people three people that maybe we didn't uphold their right whether in hosting whether in taking care of their needs or whatever it may be so we say that all of those mistakes are from ourselves and we ask all of you to uh, forgive us and anything which was good and which was right was from uh, Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala please do remember that the masjid is open for everyone and anyone anytime you know, maybe don't come at 3 o'clock knock in my door but generally anytime uh, it's open for you to come to the masjid to pray, to learn alhamdulillah we have a lot of lessons going on at the moment uh, in terms of academic lessons, we have three lessons going on. We have a Tuesday lesson, a Thursday lesson, and a Saturday um, uh, lesson. Saturday is Arabic language. We've just finished Medina Book 1. The students have their exam on Saturday. That's a reminder for them to, to revise. Uh, on uh, on uh, Thursdays, we've just finished a couple of books in Aqeedah. They've got an exam on that in two weeks as well. And we've, on Tuesday, we just finished the Tafsir book, and they've got an exam on that the week after. So my students, make sure you revise. But... Um, you know, inshallah, after those exams, we're going to start uh, new books as well. So follow the show's social medias and so on. And these lessons are in the masjid and online as well. So anyone's far away, they can join the Zoom links, they can watch the recordings, they can enter the Telegram groups, gain all of the material and, uh, and uh, everything uh, to do with the uh, masjid. 
Uh, and finally, just a reminder, inshallah, after the Q&A finishes, the QR code will go up uh, again. Uh, inshallah, please do join all of the groups, follow the social media so you have all of the updates of the masjid. Likewise, please leave a Google review for the masjid as well. That really helps the, masjid, the outreach of the masjid. For example, if somebody comes to Bradford and they want to go to a masjid, they type in mosque for praying or anything like that, then the more reviews we have, then the higher that masjid will come in terms of uh, the search. So, uh, so that's you know, a lot of benefit for the masjid in that regard as well. Also, um, you know, organizing all of this you know, financially, uh, takes, uh, it, it costs financially as well. So there's a donation link. Whoever's able to, uh, you know, aid the masjid in that regard, then please do so. As the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever builds a house for Allah, and that also includes, you know, maintaining, even if it's already built, maintaining that house. But Allah lahu baytan fil jannah. Allah subhanahu wa taala builds for him a house in, uh, in jannah. So with that. Um, Thank all of you for attending and taking your time out. And with that, Alhamdulillah, we come to the conclusion of this Dora. And inshallah, we'll have many more Dorat in the future. Jazakumullah khaira. Subhanakallahumma hamdika shadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.